Welcome back to the JPS Podcast. And in episode 84, we have the Natty Pro Roundtable with four of the natural bodybuilding world's finest, Brandon Kempter, Jeff Alberts, Sam Okunola, and Brett Freeman. Now, this roundtable discussion is super insightful for any body interested in natural bodybuilding and wanting to gain an insight into how the best of the best uh, approach contest prep and in this part of the round table there will be a second part being released in the coming weeks uh, we discuss their contest prep their nutrition and their peaking strategies for their contest prep and part two will cover training as well as some of the mindset and psychological um, related issues uh, that the guys have faced in their 2019 campaign so i'm sure you guys are going to get a hell of a lot out of this one i hope you enjoy and before we get into things just a little bit of housekeeping early bird enrollment to the jps online mentorship course is finishing on the 8th of january 2020 so if you want to save big and enroll into our online course for personal trainers to raise the standard of your coaching and upskill and improve your knowledge be sure to check the link in the description box below and join our february 2020 cohort aside from that i hope you guys enjoy this one if you do give it a like share it on social media and be sure to tag me and jps and i'll speak to you all soon all right Welcome back, guys, to a very special episode of the JPS podcast, and we're going to coin this one the Natty Pro Roundtable, as we have four natural bodybuilding professionals uh, on the line here, and we're going to be running through uh, their contest prep uh, for 2019 because they all competed this year and did so very successfully. They brought uh, to the stage not only a very impressive physique, but I think uh, the way that these guys handle themselves and the approach that they take uh, is something that is worth looking into and they can share a lot of very valuable lessons and insights uh, into their training, their diet, uh, their mindset and how they approach bodybuilding as a whole. And I think all four of them come from quite unique backgrounds. I think we have um, three of the guys, uh, fathers uh, in relationships and we obviously have Brandon who's riding solo. He's got the easiest ride uh, contest prep wise. So uh, I think uh, you know he would have had a very different prep to the other three guys who are managing all the other you know family bits and pieces. Um, but nonetheless, I think all of them will have some really interesting uh, points to share about their contest prep in 2019. I'm going to run through each of the guys. Uh, so Brandon, we'll start with you. Baseball card, stats man, how tall are you, competition weights, how many shows have you done and your favorite pose? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm 181 centimeters tall. I'm not entirely sure what that is in feet. Uh, my off-season weight ranges from around sort of 95 to 97 kilos. Uh, I jump on stage at around 78 kilos depleted, 79 uh, kilos on stage uh, glycogen loaded. Uh, my favorite pose would have to be a clasped hand most muscular. You just need to scroll down my Instagram feed. You'll see that a million and one times. Um, but, uh, yeah, and that gives you a basic overview. Awesome, man. And how many shows or seasons have you done uh, to date? Uh, to date, I actually counted this not long ago in terms of shows, and I think we're up around uh, somewhere just shy of 20, I think, 17 shows, 18 shows, something like that. Um, and that was done over one, two, three, four seasons so far. Yeah. Awesome. And for those of you who can't tell, Brandon is from my neck of the woods down here in Australia. And these other three Australia. lovely gentlemen are from the US of A. So we'll move over to you, okay. Bathtub. Uh, so the name firstly, originated from my nickname, actually, Bathtub. Where did that originate from? On the um, yeah, forums. how tall are you? About stage weight. So obviously, what uh, division Since do you I used to always in? Take a number of shows in my bathroom. Tell us uh, kind of your favorite place. Thought, oh, bro. bath, bathtub. So that's where the name came from. Um, I am five foot six and a half. I compete anywhere from one forty four to one forty six, depending on uh, the backload procedure. At Worlds, I depleted down to one forty three. Ended up on stage around 146, 147. This is my 10th year competing. I've done three seasons. 
I've done around 15 to 20 shows off the top of my head. I don't know the exact number. Uh, during the off season, I get upwards to around 165 to 175 pounds. Uh, this upcoming improvement season, I'm going to most likely rein it in a little bit. Don't exceed 165, 170. And my favorite pose, back double bicep. Definitely. Nice, man. Very cool. And Jeff, tell us about you, man. And, and throw in your oh, age. Man. Throw in your age there as well. All right. Grandpa. So I'm 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 the godfather, grandfather, grandpa of all these gentlemen. Um, no, but seriously, I've been doing this for ever. So basically, I've been I just celebrated my 33rd year of training, um, and I just competed at the Worlds, which was I don't even know how many shows it is. I want to say it's close to 40 ish, somewhere in there. And I just counted on my fingers while you guys were talking how many seasons. So I've done. I think 13 or 14 seasons and the very first show I've ever did was back in 1993 and I know probably maybe Sam was born then I'm not sure I think Sam was born maybe but I know the other two probably weren't but so just to say I've, I've seen a lot over the years um and from uh, from stat wise I'm I will do this in uh feet and inches um you know us americans we do everything backwards in comparison to the whole world so yeah i'm five foot eight um and competition weight anywhere between 168 170 on stage off season weights usually anywhere between 190 to 205 just depending how how much i want to enjoy the kids and the pizza and all that stuff so that's basically me in a nutshell from a competitive standpoint awesome man and Sam, his uh, screen's off now, but I'm sure he's going to be coming back. There you are, brother. All right. Tell us about you, man. Give us those baseball card stats. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, uh, stat. Uh, I guess we'll start with age. Uh, I'll be 36, actually, in two weeks, I think, or whenever uh, December 28 is. Uh, six one, depending on what you ask. If you ask uh, Uncle Sam, aka the United States Army, they put me down as six two. If on my um, lo- government ID card, it says six one. Uh, stage weight, roughly around two zero, depending on look or package. Uh, from can range from two ten to like two zero five. Uh, off season around two thirty. Uh, just like Brett, I'm gonna reel. I mean, reel that in a little bit. Uh, keep things a little bit tired uh, this year. Um, how many shows? I honestly, I don't know. Maybe I'm gonna say around 20, 25, maybe. Um, I mean, especially in the last three seasons, so I've I've done more than around five to six shows. So, and I've been competing since two thousand and nine. So, um, favorite uh, pose. Lately, because it used to be my shittiest pose, but I, I've, I've grown to love it uh, from light spread. So, but yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, man. And guys, you can obviously tell we have a wealth of experience here um, amongst these gentlemen. So we're going to get into the details about their 2019 campaign. And Brandon, we're going to start with you. Guys, feel free to chime in. Uh, this is going to be an open discussion. So if you want to ask Brandon questions, if you guys want to uh, discuss things, throw in your own two cents uh, for anything that he says, just feel free to do so. Uh, but Brandon, run us through how long uh, was your prep this year? I know you're a very methodical person, detail-oriented. Um, obviously, I've you know got to know you quite well over the last couple of years. Um, so run us through how long was your prep, uh, how much weight did you lose in the prep and, you know, what was the overall plan in terms of when you would, uh, you know, want to peak, um, your, at and look yeah. your best, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So my competition preparation this season was 28 weeks, uh, to show number one. And then within that season, I had essentially, uh, seven weeks and six shows, obviously majority of those being back to back. So Within my preparation strategy, um, I actually had, I think, considerably more weight to lose than the majority of these other gentlemen uh, because obviously you guys compete a lot more frequently than I do. I generally have a sort of two to three year off season and coming off last, that would have been a three year gap between shows. So the peak of my off season, I door knocked on the triple digit 100 kilo mark. Did I need to get that soft? The answer is no. 
Um, but I did have a bit of a, I did have a pre-preparatory mini cut, in which case I pulled down into sort of the mid to low nineties at the start of my prep. So if you, if you're a uh, clue, cluey with your mass right now, you will note that I did actually have a good solid 18 kilos to lose between the top of my comp prep, uh, and my base low weight depleted. So it was fairly considerable within that. I spent the first portion of my preparation getting the most aggressive section of preparation out, in which case I was around sort of 80% ready in terms of uh, the total loss by approximately 50% through the preparation. Uh, that obviously left me the back end of the preparation to slow things down so I could retain my, my training performance and obviously my hard-earned lean mass from the off-season prior. Um, then as I got to show number one, I'd essentially stop dieting uh, by – you know, putting in place a, a essentially you could call it reverse dieting if you like. Essentially, all I did was uh, close the energy gap and retain throughout the season, and that's how I was able to to peak, so to speak, show after show uh, and retain that look. And I would say that um, yes, I got a, perhaps a, a little bit tighter between show number one and, and WMDF Worlds. However, I was pretty stoked to be fair in terms of how well I was able to maintain uh, my training. Uh, sorry, my my look in terms of uh, not getting too stringy whilst retaining the t- the uh, conditioning that I had worked really hard for. Yeah, and uh, I'm a big fan of the reverse diet if you're uh, in shape early enough. So run us through quickly uh, before we're going to unpack the prep. I've got a few questions that I think will open up some cool discussion. Um, how you went uh, this season? You had a very successful season here in Australia. Then you went over to the states. Uh, you competed with a couple of these gentlemen, obviously not in the same classes, but uh, at the same shows. Um, so run us through overall, yep. how's your season? Yeah, I mean, look, the season I think overall was uh, was really successful. I started here with the ICN Nationals show uh, where I competed as a pro and I had the absolute uh, pleasure and honor of winning that show. Um, and the follow-on show, which was a fortnight later, was the ICN Worlds. Also competed there as a pro and... Um, won that, which was absolutely phenomenal. Once again, it's always a surprise to, to, to win because it's you never know. It's a subjective sport. In the fall one, I had, uh, pardon me, an IMBA show, which I won overall there, which was fantastic. And then I then uh, jumped on a plane, went to the US and did uh, the IMBA Universe, competed in the PNBA uh, show there, did a third against some absolute mass monsters. Then... Cross over to New York to for a WMBF Worlds, and uh, then I finished up with a show in Portland, and that was a bit of a throw-in show, and it was a very small show, um, just to sort of cap out the season. Awesome! So um, you had a really good season, man. I uh, saw you at Worlds uh, here in Melbourne, and you look phenomenal. So something that I think um, is interesting about your prep. Uh, is that at least from our discussions and chats I've had with other people uh, in the Australian bodybuilding scene is that you're not a huge fan of diet breaks or extended periods of maintenance during the prep. You're a little bit more hardcore, you're sadistic, and I guess that's why you're a very good bodybuilder because you know how to push it um, and go to those uh, dark places that not many other people are comfortable going to. Uh, So run us through um, the strategy this year uh, did you include diet breaks, refeeds, um, or was it pretty much you know foot on the pedal um, with you know taking the foot off only when necessary? Look, I mean, I'll say I'm, I'm definitely a fan. I will say of diet breaks and utilizing intermittent dieting strategies. Um, refeeding strategies are something that I've utilized for years with my own athletes and clients. Uh, same with diet breaks. However, on myself, I'm probably a little bit more resistant in that. Um, I enjoy the suffering, so to speak. Throughout this period, uh, or throughout the entire preparation, I, I refed a minimum of once per week. However, on the majority of scenarios, I was doing two to three high days. Um, in terms of diet breaks, I had short diet breaks, but they would be, uh, you could call them extended refeeding periods, where they sort of range from three to five days in duration. Um, but I never really spent anything longer than that at caloric maintenance. Um, gives you a bit of an idea. But essentially, uh, I mean, I love the hardcore aspects, but uh, I definitely was was quite inclusive of refeed periods from the perspective of, of retaining uh, training performance and as a part of that, you know, retaining stimulus required to retain lean mass. Um, so, yeah. 
Sorry. Yeah, no, just to clarify, I know that you use those strategies with clients, but I know uh, as you coach yourself, um, you're just a little bit more reluctant because you do have that uh, you know, hardcore mentality. So I'm going to flip it over to Jeff because I know <laughs> Jeff's uh, prep uh, in comparison to yours, Brandon, which was... How did, how did I know you were going to go to me after Brandon? Man, you, you went you're the to godfather. the young guy and then to the old guy. He's like, okay, here's this hardcore... Dude, now we're gonna go to the the old soft guy. No, no, no. So yeah, it's it's not about going from hard to soft. It's about going from a very uh, planned and almost you know the perfect prep, so to speak, where you know uh, Brandon had um, you know twenty eight weeks for to his first show. Um, you know, I know Brandon on a personal level when he comes to Melbourne to our events uh, through JPS, he's got his Tupperware. It's all you know uh, measured to the gram. He's very meticulous. Where um, you know, I've seen you in prep, Jeff, and you're a little bit more flexible. You use your experience to your advantage, and I know that this prep for you was, um, yeah, not uh, not not to say that it wasn't as well executed as Brandon's, because I think it was uh, in terms of outcomes, but it definitely wasn't the same because you had the prep. Uh, I think it was last year, was it? Or yeah, last year, and then you pulled the pin on that uh, last year or the year before. I can't remember now. Uh, but then this was. Yeah. This was a follow-up to that. So do you want to speak to that? Yeah. I just first want to say I'm just giving you a hard time and you just want to kind of lighten the mood up because it's kind of like so serious. But I would say like Brandon reminds me a lot of myself back in the day. And I think that's a good thing to have, like to actually go through, you know, preps like that. Because I've had like preps where I didn't cheat on my diet not one time through many, many weeks of dieting and got to the stage peeled back in the day when, you know, there were shows back in the day when I was the leanest guy on stage. So I, I understand and get that, that side of it. But I think um, what I loved about this podcast idea was that we were going to get a lot of perspectives where all of us could offer a lot of different people, a lot of different contexts and tools to work with. So I just want to say, I really do appreciate you, you doing this, Jacob. And I look up to all three of these guys, man, because there's every I can look at each one of these guys and take something from them and apply it to my next prep. So I just want to say that before I start. But yeah, like my prep was almost seems opposite of that just because I made it more of a like trying to incorporate real life with bodybuilding because I am a family man. I am a dad and a husband before I'm a bodybuilder. So not one point in the prep where. I put myself ahead of them as far as like if I had to take myself to another level or another gear, even like the last two or three weeks before our world, I even had this conversation with Brett, like I was done. I'm like, I'm not going to go to another level because my prep was 14 months long. And it, I know people will hear that and go, oh God, this guy prepped for 14 months, but it was more lifestyle. Like I would chip away at certain things. Like when I first started the prep, take 10 pounds off. Okay, holidays are coming. Chill out for two weeks. Okay, let's take another 10 pounds off. Let's chill out. So it was more more of like, okay, let me pick my spots like a boxer. Like, okay, let me get in. Let me get out. Let me pick my spots. And again, it's like with the family dynamic, it's like the last two or three worlds. I'm like, they've had enough. You know, it was like we're talking 13, 14 months of this. And I'm like, if I go to another level, just so I can maybe, you know, get, you know, no, look like I'm like no skin and I got to put them through two or three more weeks of misery. I'm like, I'm going to do this again. I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Like I'm 48. I do plan on coming back when I'm 50. So I'm like, I can do this again. So for me, it was just a decision I made and I was comfortable with it. And of course, you know, at Worlds, I didn't get the type of conditioning that, you know, is, let's say, a Sam Okanola or a Brett Freeman, but it was enough for me to be okay with where I was at. And I had a great season. Like the whole goal, like you said, Jacob, was in 2017, 2018, I, I didn't even make it to the stage. Like injuries just kind of side, you know, just sidelined me. And I didn't even know if I was even going to make it this year. So for me, it was more about, hey, let me, I just want to get back in there and have fun again. I want to be able to get on stage and take grandpa's cane and step on Sam's toes with it. Like it didn't matter if I was beating Sam, losing to Sam. It was like, I just want to get in there and have fun and enjoy it again, and enjoy the sport. And, you know, just meeting like Brandon at Worlds, like the first time meeting him in, in person, like that memory right there is going to outlast like 
oh yeah, I didn't push myself the last three weeks. So it's, for me, it's like, it's just, it's a different perspective, different mentality for me nowadays versus like when I first started this sport, when I first started, it was just, let's go baby. Let's just win. Like everything was just like hardcore. I got to win, got to prove to others that I, I'm, I'm better. But I mean, I've, I've been there, done that. So for me, it's just a totally different perspective now. And um, yeah, I look back on my season, like every day that I look back on it, it just gets better and better. You know, at first, I, to be honest, I was disappointed walking off stage, you know, not hit top five. And I remember seeing Brett and he's like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. Like not until I can see photos and get a real glimpse as to exactly what happened. So after seeing the professional photos, you know, and really being honest with myself, I'm like, yeah, there's five guys that were better than me. I could live with that because I did everything the way I wanted to do it leading up to it. And whatever result I get, take responsibility for it. I'm, I'm good. So that doesn't mean, hey, I want to do better next time. But so, yeah, I'm going to definitely come back at, as a 50 year old and see if I could step on Sam's toes a little bit more. But uh, but yeah, but that's kind of like my perspective. But yeah, it's just a, it was a 14 month prep. But again, it was more like like a lifestyle prep where I picked my spots here and there. So, there, yeah, there was refeeds. There was diet breaks. Refeeds were auto regulated. So sometimes, you know, I'd be eating like 400 grams of carbs. If I felt like shit, hey, I'm going to eat 700 just because I need to feel good again, recharge the batteries so I can sustain this. Because I knew I had a long road ahead of me. You know, we're talking 14 months. I did six shows. No, seven. I did seven shows this season, which is the most I've ever done in one season. And looking back in hindsight, for me anyways, the prep was about two months too long. I think I peaked my best in September tried to hold on to that and it just was like with real life and all that it was like nope because i had vacations family vacations i had guests posing in mexico city like it my body was just like what are you doing it was like just way too long so but yeah i'm gonna let these other gentlemen talk because i'm old man I'm, t I'm getting out of breath just talking so no man that was awesome and i think yeah it just offers a really unique uh perspective to how you can approach prep and that uh, sometimes perfection uh, is an illusory goal um, that we try to attain in bodybuilding and often not needed to you know, excel in the sport. Uh, so you obviously had the pressure, Jeff, of competing this year and making it to the stage after obviously 2017, 2018, not making it to the stage. So I'm going to flip it to Brett because you were the 2017 uh, world champion, um, I believe, and you had a different set of pressures coming into this prep um, and this campaign going back to back, which you did successfully. So how did you approach prep this time, knowing that last time, you know, in contrast to Jeff, who had a lot to sort of, uh, you know, learn and change going into his uh, season this year, you had, you know, obviously a really good prep. Did you try to replicate that uh, this go around? Uh, were there many things that you changed? Uh, tell us uh, about your prep this year. Um, I would say they differed quite a bit. Honestly, 2017, I kind of look at as a fluke. It was my return to the stage after a six-year layoff, more or less, where training was subpar. It's not a fluke. It happened. Get I know. Over it. <laughs> I know. That's you already know, you already know the backstage story. So <laughs> it's yeah, still don't believe it happened. So I after you know winning my pro card in 2017, placing top five. And then debuting at Worlds in 2017 and winning, I didn't feel like it really happened almost. So that was the mindset going into 2019, in which it was an all or nothing season leading up to Worlds, where I felt as if I had a target on my back. So there was a lot of pressure I felt riding on me the entire season. So I did start off a little bit conservatively and uh, passive in regards to the uh, deficit so the first six to eight months i more or less just not necessarily winged but i didn't diet as aggressively as i had in uh, 2017 um up until the mr universe where the only reason i did that show was it was the same show that i won my pro card in in 2017 only the pro portion and i wanted to see how i actually stacked up against in my opinion one of the best lightweights slash middleweights in the world which is uh, Garino Mackey, Iron Lord on Instagram. So after uh, going up against him in the Mr. Universe, that kind of 
showed me what true elite bodybuilders do look like. And I, it kind of sealed the deal that I might potentially be world class almost. Um, but over the duration of the actual uh, deficit, it was a 10 to 11 month prep. I started off, I want to say, I think I was 180 at the peak of my off season. Not that pretty. And the rate of loss over the course of the 10 months was very conservative. As I said, it was around 0.25 to half a pound per week. Um, refeeds were uh, two to three times per week. Um, I didn't really toss in any diet breaks until the Max Hype show where the family and us, uh, we went on vacation. Even, even then it was a, it was a five day diet break. Aside from that, there was a two to three day, uh, period after the Mr. Universe where I was, I was debating doing worlds or kind of pulling, you know, the plug on the season. Just due to the toll it was taking on the relationship because i mean like jeff has stated like doing a you know six to eight to nine month prep is it's pretty tough on the family um yeah <laughs> yeah man no uh, i think um the it's weird reflecting <laughs> yeah no i i think uh the family situation is a, a variable that uh only People who have experienced it uh, will understand. Um, but now, kudos yeah. to you, man, for making it through and uh, getting all the way. We'll um, we'll come back to you in in a minute. And Sam, tell us about your prep. You're the the biggest. I think you're the heaviest on stage here. Um, so you're the you're the man. Um, you know when it comes to the pound for pound. And tell us about your prep. Tell us about uh, how many weeks it was, the overall approach. I know that these fellas pretty much coach themselves. Um, I know that uh, Brett worked with Cliff Wilson uh, for his final peak, I believe. And I know Jeff uh, has Eric sort of look over things and it's a very much a collaborative process, especially towards the back end of things. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Brandon, I know you go solo. Um, I'm sure you have people um, in your corner. I will jump in there. Uh my great friend Nathan Wallace was a, was very instrumental at the back end, particularly in the first couple of peak weeks uh, and the final six weeks. He was my breaks essentially to say, "Don't be an idiot." <laughs> in terms of you know overshooting my recovery from a training perspective and that kind of thing. So I will say, Interesting. I although it was mostly solo, there was definitely um, some external influence. I'll also say that my partner Rachel, mm -hmm. um, having been involved in bodybuilding as closely as she has with me over the years has definitely also kept the lid on me uh, in terms of my own, my own physique. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, Sam, did you self-prep? Um, yes. So, for the majority of uh, the prep, I did prep myself. Uh, just like, I mean, any, anyone here can attest, you have that guy that you want to go to that can literally just – give it to you straight like if you, you know, drag an ass if you can you know you know put the foot i mean take the foot of the pedal a little bit but you need that guy because you're always going to second guess yourself even though when you're doing things right like you know the things the uh the the strategies that you do that if you if you were to put yourself as a client like i'm this is totally normal but in your brain like i don't know i mean just you just second guess everything so my go-to guy was uh chris barricat and uh, my approach uh, to prep was a little, coming into the uh, the season was a little bit different, um, just because I wanted to challenge myself. And one of the challenges that I wanted to uh, take on was uh, just compete an NPC show. I, uh, Jeff had you know compete an NPC show before. I've never done an NPC show before, so just when you know, and luckily for me because I live around St. Louis area, there's a big show here, and uh, and I I knew I wasn't gonna be. Uh, a hundred percent. I knew I was going to be like 80, 85 ish percent, uh, which I would never do again because I saw pictures of what I looked like on stage and it was not pleasing at all. Um, and, uh, <laughs> it's so hard on yourself. Get out of here. Really? And, uh, never going to do that again. Um, the, uh, but luckily I won the, uh, overall, um, I did classic physique here, uh, different trunks for people who don't know what classic physique is. Um, is. 
Uh, you don't show too much uh, glue striations. So yes, I had a decent glue, but it was not. It was not. It was not Brandon esque. The, wa- um, the walnut. But, uh, the walnut butt. The, yeah, it was not. And this this was this was back in back no, in no, April. No, 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 cat butt, cat, <laughs> cat. <laughs> and this was this was back in this was back in April, and I was like, you know what? Why not? So at that time, actually, um, Chris Barrack had did my peak just because I want to try like a different strategy. I was picking methods. I usually I'm I'm a big fan for, for myself. I um, big fan of rapid backloading. And I think Chris Barakat's uh, strategy is a little bit similar, but quite different in terms of like water manipulation and stuff like that. And uh, it was pretty good. You know, I won overall. It was good. That qualified me for uh, Junior Nationals, uh, which was in Chicago. And the reason why I'm doing this also is just because of local, like, family, friends, you know, can come, you know, watch me compete. And originally, I'm from Chicago. Chicago's about four hours away. And I'm like, okay. I mean, it's Junior Nationals. Might as well jump into that, too. Uh, that was... Uh, so the first one was in April. June National was in June in Chicago, uh, which I obviously had dug a little bit deeper. Uh, the further I could, no diet breaks or anything like that, uh, I think I lost like another four or five pounds uh, for that show. And um, came in a little tighter. Chris Barrett had hopped on and did like uh, my peak week also for that show. Um, out of Class D, uh, I mean, I was still, I think I was the smallest guy in that class. Um, Class D is like six feet and above, and the weight um, is around two, two eleven to like two forty. And I think I stepped on the scale like two ten. And he was competing against guys with two forty on stage, and you know about the same height as you. Um, my class I think was like fourteen or fifteen guys. I ended up placing fourth out of those um, those guy uh, the class. And um, mayhem did mayhem in July. Uh, about four weeks after that, won the show. And mayhem uh, did. Uh, Max Hive with this awesome gentleman, uh, grandpa and grandson, um, album coming out next week. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, did uh, Jordan Cup and then Worlds. Uh, but overall, my approach, uh, the challenge, there was definitely a challenge, just like, in, I mean, it's going to be uh, a, almost like a broken record here. Every guy, every, I mean, Jeff, uh, Brett, all family guy. Mine is a little bit different in this case just because um, I became a father this year, so prepping with a newborn was quite uh, <laughs> was quite challenging. Um, how I was going to execute that? I mean, you can write everything out on paper, but in terms of execution, it's it's a different ball game. Like, I mean, auto regulation is your best friend at that point. Like, you know, everything that you have is just like, okay, I'm going to do this. No, I'm not going to do this. I mean, in terms of training, I had to literally switch on my training part. Um, I and I work a nine to five job. Uh, you know, I go to work and I'm I'm leaving. Normally, the time I have leaving go. I mean, going to going to work at nine uh, seven 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 thirty in the morning. Um, get off work at five o'clock. Go to the gym and train, and come back home. I don't have that luxury anymore. It's like I leave work. I'm going straight home to the family, and that's it. That's like shut down for the day. Whatever's not done, it's not done. So the different strategies that I took, you know, step count was the key. I'm talking about literally just pacing around the freaking house just to get my step count in, or make it waking up early in the morning just to get a little bit, of, a little bit of uh, uh, maybe like a mile walk in or something like that. Um, that's definitely different, but it was very, I mean, definitely doable just because um, I'm very fortunate to have a su- uh, supportive wife that you know that was very. I mean, I know you have to do this uh, without her. I mean, she told me, hey, you're not gonna. Um, I need you to stay around, um, you know, because it's kind of overwhelming. Of course, I'm not going to compete. I'll, of course, I'll cap it right there. But, um, but yeah, um, I think I'm, I made a post on Instagram the other day too. Like, I mean, uh, it's very hard for uh, it's for you to be successful at something. You need to. Uh, it's hard to be 100 percent at everything. You have to pick that one thing that you know. Uh, you are going to be 100% and then you have to be okay with being 80%, 60% in all the areas of your life. And my main focus, of my main goal that I want to be 100% has been a dad and a husband. So I had to be okay with being so par or being, you know, falling slightly short because, you know, I missed a couple of workouts here and um, a couple of cardio here and there. And I I had to be okay with that, which I was totally fine. And given the result that I ended up with the season with, I'm completely uh, happy and content with that result. 
But all in all, it was very, uh, it was it was fun. I mean, I had a fun, a lot of, you know, had a good time uh, doing it. Uh, besides the fact that you know my wife usually comes to my show, so she wasn't. I mean, she only made it to like that one show this year. And uh, but yeah, it was a fun experience stepping on stage with this uh, <laughs> gentleman. I mean, if you see any of these videos in uh, uh, pre-judging, I mean, Jeff uh, has got a fun way of uh, cracking people up on stage while they're trying to hold a strong pose. <laughs> No, man, yeah. that's that's awesome. I, I think it's so refreshing to, to have you guys on because over the last few years, we've obviously had a huge paradigm shift in the way that we approach training and diet, uh, you know, flexible dieting, for example, something that's more prominent, uh, you know, not only in the body composition world, but bodybuilding, as is auto-regulation. I think you guys, uh, especially you three, um, great examples of how uh, we can, you know, navigate our, ourselves towards, uh, you know, successful prep, um, you know, despite not being perfect and adjusting things, you know, based on, uh, you know, how we're responding to not only the plan, but, you know, changes in life um, and all those sorts of things. And I really like the analogy, Sam, of, you know, if you want to be good at something, um, you know, you can only be good at one thing per se and other things have to take a back seat. Um, and I liken that to, to jugg juggling balls. You know, only one ball at any point in time can be right at the top. You just have to keep a handle on all the other things and make sure you don't drop any. Um, and I think that's uh, something that has helped, has helped me conceptualize, you know, contest prep. It's like, you know, certain times of the day, certain weeks, certain months of, you know, the prep, you have to have one thing or another at the top and others just, you know, can't fall through your uh, your hands, so to speak. But um, no, very cool. Uh, I want to talk more about uh, your approach to nutrition because speaking of flexible dieting i think uh, a lot of people have the understanding that if you just hit your calories and macros you're good uh, but obviously to get to the level of conditioning that you guys brought to the stage uh you know just eating pop tarts and things like this isn't going to cut it because you, your hunger is going to be through the roof obviously satiation becomes something that's extremely important as does you know minimizing food focus and things like this um so does your approach to tracking and monitoring uh your diet uh change throughout the prep for example uh you know do you start off you know um i think it was brett you said you were just sort of like chilling cruising at the start were you um you know not tracking food and just sort of you know eyeballing using your experience and then start tracking then did you create a meal plan for example or is it from start to finish you're following the same approach um you know we'll start with Brandon, we'll come back to you, man. Like, how do you go about start to finish your prep? Does your diet uh, change in terms of the approach you take to controlling your calories and macros? Yeah. Cool, yeah. Yeah, look, um, at the start of preparation, obviously, um, my hunger is essentially nil. Coming off a long off season where my, my uh, hunger by fear back signaling is so desensitized, the last thing I want to do is eat food. So I actually keep um, my food selections quite similar. I simply chip into the food volumes in order to please the required caloric deficit to make the necessary losses. As I progress through preparation and hunger begins to increase, then what I'll obviously do is, is modulate my food volume uh, as a means of managing uh, hunger. Now, what I de generally do is I tend to scale things depending on where I am in my preparation in that I don't want to exploit volume too much at the start. Otherwise, I've essentially, you know, bottomed out that tool. Uh, and I will also mention that I'm a bit of a sadist, as you guys kind of know, and, and in which case I tend to associate hunger positively with uh, dieting effect. Uh, it's not that simplistic. As you know, hunger by feedback signaling is vastly complicated. Um, however, Towards the back end of preparation, for example, when I was reverse dieting, my hunger sensitivity dropped quite substantially, and I actually modified my food volume uh, downward so that I had a hunger response so that I felt as though I was working hard. And that's just a bit of a psychological thing from my behalf because I tend to, again, correlate that positively from a psychological standpoint with, with diet effect. Um, but, I mean, I am definitely an advocate for a flexible approach throughout an off-season. However, as you know, I like to – tightly control my nutritional variables, in which case, as I progress through preparation, my dieting strategy gets a little bit more rigid in terms of the food selections I incorporate, simply as a means of reducing uh, essentially nutrition, you know, my cloud of variance when it comes to tracking nutritional inputs. So by the end of preparation, I'm quite, quite rigid on the most behalf. Uh, and I would say in life in general, I'm an exceptionally routine gentleman. However, traveling in the US really changed things for me because in the US, 
yes, we have food availability. However, in that time, I had three weeks in the U.S. without a kitchen. I just had a microwave. I microwaved everything. And second of that, U.S. labeling is quite dissimilar to Australia in that you guys call things zero calorie when they're not because FDA rules state that if it's sub five calories per standard measure uh, or per serve, then it is quote unquote calorie free. Where I was, I would track that because I'm looking at you know plus or minus nine calories per day. And second of that is that fiber is obviously gross fiber, not net fiber in Australia. So I would track PCF plus fiber, whereas you guys have, well, PCF inclusive, well, carbohydrate inclusive fiber. So adjusting my, um, my sort of uh, nutritional systems to that, um, was a good exercise in showing me that, hey, I can probably incorporate a little bit more flexibility along the way, uh, and still manage okay. Cool. And just, uh, to give listeners a bit of an insight, when you, uh, going through your day, do you weigh and measure all of your food? I presume you do. Uh, do you track it into my fitness pal or have you just got a meal plan with the portions that you're following? Uh, do you change that from day to day, week to week, or is it something that's predetermined um, and you stick to it like glue? Yeah. Look, in an off season scenario, I track everything in my fitness pal um, quite religiously because it's simplistic, easy, and it's a point of enjoyment for me. In comp prep, I actually utilize a, a nutrition software to, well, yeah, nutrition software to develop my nutrition plan. And on my low days, I stick with that. My refeed days or my high days obviously come with uh, more inherent flexibility just simply due to having a larger caloric allotment to work with. And that would be the day that I'd be somewhat flexible. However, by the end of my comp prep, I was incorporating the same foods at, at, the, at higher volumes essentially as a means of, again, minimizing nutritional variance and keeping things similar so I can assess the outcome and make logical manipulations from that. Um, but I track everything. As you know, I'm probably a bit more meticulous than I need to be in that, you know, I came to one of your JPS events and I'm sitting there sipping Pepsi it's Max. Called and OCD, man. What's my... Well, I mean, it's bodybuilder brand, right? Um, but it's a point of enjoyment for me, I'll say. Uh, and I was tracking the, the high-intensity sweetness towards my carbohydrate count. Sunk four bottles of that, you know, chuck the three grams of carbs towards it. Um, <laughs> but that's essentially how I, how I roll, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Now, we'll flip over to you, Jeff, because I know uh, yours is much more behavior-based. Um, there's ranges on your macros um, and calories. And there, well, if your prep was anything like um, Eric's this year, I'm sure there's a lot more sort of day-to-day variance in calorie intake based on activity levels and things like that. Um, so run us through your uh, nutrition approach. Yeah, so let me give context first. So it's, it's just, you know, this is my like 100th millionth prep. So I know myself really well. So yeah, it's behavior. I know my behaviors. I know where my parents' levels are. I, I basically know where my thresholds are. So a lot of the way I approached nutrition was, okay, what's practical for me and what's sustainable? Not so much, hey, what does science tell me? Yeah, I can look at that a little bit, but I know myself well. Like for me personally, you know, you put me on below 200 grams of carbs, it might last for about two or three days and then I'm going to go binge. So, and that's just from history, right? I know my history. So it's like, okay, I know I do very well on low fat decently amount of carbs and i'm not a uh, particular one who enjoys to eat a shit ton of protein um i used to back in the day um i think it's just from doing it so much i got sick of it and tired of it i've drinking probably more protein shakes than these three gentlemen put together over the years and i'm just like no i don't want no protein shakes so for me like when i when i think of hunger i'm like we're control starving ourselves right like you got to expect you're going to be hungry. So mentally I'm like, okay, you're just, you're just going to be hungry. Like if I'm going to spend all my energy thinking about it, how to go about not being hungry, it's just going to make me more neurotic and more stressed. So I'm like, okay, let me just embrace the fact I'm going to be hungry. It doesn't mean I didn't at times be strategic about it, but you know, okay, let me eat a bigger salad here or something like that. But I didn't game plan my day based around, trying not to be hungry. It was just more or less, okay, what do I know I can adhere to and I can sustain this for more for 14 months? And, you know, like Brandon was saying early on, it's like, yeah, not hunger is like non-existent. You know, I had plenty of energy on my body. 
Um, and it wasn't towards you get deeper into prep when you, you start to, you know, feel the, uh, the, the hunger come on a little bit more. Um, but as far as like a strategy standpoint, I would just kind of think about, okay, where am I the most active during the day? And for me personally, during the, the morning times, I'm sitting here at my desk, you know, doing nothing, you know, just talking on the computer. So like my breakfast is usually like the smallest meal of the day. And I train in the afternoon, so I just load up at lunchtime. That's the biggest meal. And then I have a couple of moderate meals after training. And the last meal of the day is like, hey, let me enjoy something that tastes decent. Um, might not be, quote unquote, the most cleanest foods, but I'm going to sit there with my family and eat something I enjoy and put my feet up at the end of the day and kind of enjoy myself. So that for me personally, it's like I know I could sustain that over the long haul versus being like I used to be back in the day, being a bro where I would eat six meals per day. It was chicken, brown rice, broccoli, green vegetables, whatever. Like I was a robot back then. And if you were to ask my wife now how I prep, she'd say, well, it's not that bad. But you ask my ex-wife how I used to prep, she'd probably tell you a whole different story. So just for me, again, it's like the experience. Of, so when I coach my athletes, of course, I want to try to be as optimal as possible, but I also want to know, get to know the individual and see like, okay, what are their thresholds? What can they adhere to? What can they sustain over the long haul? There might be points in time where I have to say, you know what, you have to buckle down here. Now you need to put that, that, that uh, Wendy sandwich down. Okay. Put the fast food down. Let's, let's have that chicken breast and brown rice. But that's more or less kind of my approach to nutrition in a, as a whole. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Sam, how was your approach, man? Um, so my approach is you can take a little bit of uh, Brandon's and, and Jeff and put it together. And uh, in terms of Jeff, like being a little more flexible, my flexibility came on the weekends, and that just happened to be when I do my refeeds. I was uh, pretty much for the most uh, part of the prep, I did a forty-eight hour refeed, uh, depending on where. Uh, energy level or how maybe resistance, you know, the fat loss uh, got, then I might, you know, do a diet break or just do like a 72 hour refeed then then go back to some sort of a digging phase. And I use uh, pretty much just like any of you guys, I'm sure you guys have done with clients before. I just use, I use my refeed as sort of a, um, a mental break, so to speak, still adhering with within the top protocols of, you know, a, a structured refeed, not just a, a quote unquote cheat. That's just, you know, uh, if, you know, wife needs to have like a nice dinner or something like that. I mean, again, back to the whole point of having, you know, having a kiss, just sometimes to distress a little bit. That's one of the things I use my refeeds, refeeds for. But for the most part, um, I just like Brandon said, I typically eat the same thing um, all year round. Uh, again, my day is very structured in terms of I wake up in the morning, get ready, go to work. Uh, like most Americans or whoever have a corporate job, go to work, um, have your lunch break or whatever, and uh, and and go by your day when you come back home. So that obviously changed because normally I typically work out after work around 5, 5.30, but I had to switch my workout and try to find ways to train during my lunch break, meaning I have to go in, get my training session in as hard as I can in the next like 30, 35 minutes. I uh, do some sort of cardio because I have a very sedentary lifestyle. Literally, I mean, I barely crack four thousand if I'm not doing anything a day. So that cardio needs to get done, or to at least reach that ten thousand step uh, threshold. Um, so obviously, the food strategy sort of changed a little bit, uh, meaning I'm pushing a little bit more of my food towards the beginning of the day. Um, and that kind of made it a little bit tougher towards the end uh, as the days go. I mean, as the leaner you get, the more the hunger, uh, uh, pain starts to like you know come through throughout throughout, um, throughout the rest of the day. But again, just like Brandon said, it's body good, and so you just got to suck it up. It's part of it's it's just part of. I mean, conscious prep. You are gonna get hungry. You just got to suck it up and find ways to uh, deal with it. But overall, um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty. I mean. Again, if you, most of us will probably do more of a quote unquote bro diet just because it's easier, it's repetitive, it's structured, we can repeat it over and over and over again. And every now and then it might just go outside of something in the realms of quote unquote flexible diet. I mean, if for your macros and just, you know, just want to find something different for your taste buds. And uh, I use, definitely use my refeed as days when I can do that. I mean, I love my cereal. So it's like clean up like boxes of cereal and I'm content. <laughs> 
that's literally my favorite cheat meal. I think I did a Q and A the other day, and people were like, "What cereal?" I'm like, you guys don't understand. I love cereal, and uh, I know uh, uh, Garino and uh, Brandon are working together right now. Garino and I, we we vibe on that same level. Like we literally we hoard macros just to have a whole box of cereal. That's my go to. <laughs> That's because y'all guys in the US do cereal <laughs> like no other. In Australia, I literally brought a second suitcase home just for cereal. I brought all the pumpkin spice cereal I could possibly get because it's you, next, you are next you month. are welcome. <laughs> we 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 gifted you all the sugar that we that we that we needed to stop. That's brilliant. Oh, I love man. it. <laughs> and it's interesting how over the last few years after the the boom of if it fits your macros that uh you know we've seen a lot of bodybuilders you know go to one end of the spectrum with the you know fitting pop tarts and all these things into their macros you know deep into a prep to then swing back the other way um you know that's just how the fitness industry rolls we swing from one extreme to another and generally the answer lies in the middle um bathtub tell us about your prep man what did the food look like and uh yeah nutrition side of things how was that for you it was honestly a mixture of everybody's. Brandon, I mean, he pretty much hit the nail on the head with how I approach uh, the beginning phases of my diet. I actually, I, I believe I made a post on Instagram a few days ago in regards to the past decade and if it fits the macros and how I heavily abuse it. So there were, I mean, during you know the last five six years of my off season, I was that dude eating pop tarts and whey for every single meal because it fit my macros. Um. But during the start of my contest prep, um, everything was liquid calories, actually, for the first month, I would say. Just, you know, due to satiety, I mean, I, I was full 24-7 up until I was around 162, 165. And then it wasn't until around, you know, the four month out from World's Mark where satiety started to become an issue. And that's where decision fatigue kind of started to interrupt with flexible dieting. And that's when I started um, to employ a, a more rigid meal structure, not necessarily mapping out every single meal day to day, but coming down with actual food selection choices, uh, keeping a limit on them, which also helps um, the rate of loss, uh, visual, you know, visual progress, being more consistent throughout the days and the weeks. Whereas when I was flexible dieting and kind of just freestyling my macros, uh, weight fluctuations would spike throughout the days and the weeks. And then the last month, a month and a half uh, towards Worlds, it was the most rigid I had ever been, in which I did actually sit down, map out a meal plan to the T. And I, I don't believe it's sustainable long term i mean especially heading into the off season just due to i mean i'm very similar to jeff in that i am a lot more flexible and i don't really track macros two to three months post competition prep just due to um i can eyeball everything more or less since i i know i've been i've been weighing things on a food scale for 10 to 11 years so 112 grams of chicken, I can eyeball it, most likely to the tea. And yeah. Awesome, man. I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot to, uh, you know, gradation of rigidity and restraint in a contest prep, um, you know, starting with more flexibility, less rigidity, and then, you know, tightening things up as you go so that you can like pull the elastic band uh, all the way back without it snapping your shit up, um, you know, too soon, so to speak. Um, but no, that was very, very cool uh, to hear all of your insights. And I want to now move into peak week. And I think given um, how extensive this discussion has been, we might even need to break uh, training up into a completely separate discussion. I don't even want to open that rabbit hole now nearing the uh, hour mark. So we'll talk about peak week uh, and then we'll go through your biggest challenge, uh, you know, in this prep um that you can remember if there was a specific moment where you're like fuck that was the hardest part um you know if i prep this season i uh, will go through that so peak week brandon what does your peak look like was it different from show to show um do you rinse and repeat the same uh, method each time um yeah so look my peak varied a little bit throughout the season um i'm definitely 
I will say that uh, when I get flat, so to speak, I take flat to the next level to the point where, you know, my legs feel like they're a literal 30% smaller when they're glycogen depleted. But, hey, that's part of getting lean. Um, and obviously coming into show, probably the biggest thing uh, or objective we're trying to achieve is, is to top up muscle glycogen and obviously down the stress response uh, and look our best coming into that show. So coming into show number one, I actually ran uh, – uh, quite a large taper just because it'd been quite some time since the, since the prior deload. So I tapered my training down uh, for, for an entire week coming into it uh, across the board in terms of relative intensity and I utilize the front load. For me personally, uh, I need a considerable amount of carbohydrate. I need to do it over multiple days, you know, in order to, to actually fill out. So that was successful. And then in the follow one, I had back to back shows and that obviously presents a, a, a different. Uh, challenge in terms of managing your look so i uh, employed a, a backload moving into the follow-on shows and at that point i had reversed my lowest my low day calories around 600 calories above the the lowest that ever been and the lowest was around sort of i think it was about three to four five five to three weeks out somewhere in that mark, benchmark there so show number one was the lowest and, and then i would have a two to three day load into show plus the show day itself so realistically, um, going show to show, it was actually really quite easy in that uh, I definitely wasn't struggling from a mental standpoint. I would have, um, I think, one, two, uh, there was about three, three to four days show and then 350, and then I would dose up to around the sort of 500, 550 mark for a series of days. And then on the, on the day, it was dependent on what time I was on stage, anywhere from sort of 400 to 700 grams, of, uh, 600 grams of carbs. So uh, by the end, the last three shows, it was a wash and repeat scenario because everything was just lined up quite well and I was able to retain my total body mass and conditioning and trainability throughout that, that time. Awesome, awesome. Jeff, how's your peaking strategy, man? Dear Lord, man, seven shows. I can't say I. You know what? It's been almost forty shows, and I can't say I've had a perfect peak. Um, it was, like, does does it even exist? Too, like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, at times you look better than other times, but also too, I just want to point out before, like, how you assess if you peaked well or not. Like, how do you base that? Because you, you're basing it off of maybe photos and video you're seeing. You got to factor in stage lighting. You got to factor in camera quality. Who's taking the pictures? Like some of the shows, I look back at my shows. I'm like, man, I look like shit there. And then I have other people say, no, you actually peaked pretty damn good. And then vice versa. So even in Worlds, I thought, man, that's, I sucked. Like I just felt like I looked like shit. And then once I saw the professional pictures, I'm like, unless they edited these really good to make people look good, I go, I look pretty good here. <laughs> so I'm like. And I thought I peaked terrible. That was my worst peak. So I just want to point that out. Like how you assess that is like, like it's, there's so many variables to look at and consider. Uh, but for me personally, like over the years I've done, like back in the day, like back in the 90s, there was no such a thing as front loads. It was just all back loads. So I've, I've experimented with back loads. In 2011, I did nothing but front loads. I peaked well there. And I think a lot of it for me, it's, it's the context leading up to a show. Like my very first show of 2019 was the, the Muscle Mayhem. And I was behind a little bit as far as conditioning. So that's when I brought Eric Helms on. I'm like, hey, keep me accountable. We need to dig. We need to go back to my old days and grind the fuck out like the next eight weeks to even look presentable at Mayhem. And it was for me, it was about getting on stage again, not really trying to win, but just getting there. So there was a lot of digging leading up into that show. So I knew I needed to be more aggressive um, by keeping the dieting process going. So we extended the dieting all the way until Wednesday of the show. Like it was going hard. And then it was Thursday, Friday. Okay, let's be aggressive with a backload to fill out so I don't look flat on stage. So basically just went heavy on carbs Thursday, Friday, loaded up. Kept sodium relatively the same. It upticked naturally just because I was eating more food. And I just made sure to increase my water intake as well. And I peaked pretty good considering the conditioning level I was at. And um, I got lucky. And I got one first place vote against Sam. So I got very lucky. Uh, but I did make him laugh on stage. You just, you, I made you, just had, you, just, you just had to bust that out, huh? I had to, man. It's just, I mean, can't you just give me one vote out of two shows? You know, just one. Um, 
it looked really bad when he cracked up laughing on stage. So, but that was like that. So for me, like that first show, on my, was, on my on my YouTube channel, there's a video evidence of it. <laughs> yeah, like well, let's just say my son, he doesn't even. I'm not even his. He's like he loves Sam more than me now. So same. That's how. Yeah, I mean Sam's just like a great guy all around. Ethan is the man. Sit. So yeah, the first show was just like a more of a, a heavier backload, um, which worked well. And then the second show, I was like, okay, I, I'm gonna do the max hype. I knew Sam was gonna do it, so I'm like, okay, I gotta keep grinding because I need to get that conditioning level to even come close to him. And um, I did get more conditioned. So again, I was kind of digging into that show. So again, I went, I went with a one day load, like more like a rapid backload uh, for that show. Um, I basically, I think I had like close to 900 grams of carbs on Friday, which is quite a bit for me. And I thought I peaked okay for that show. Um, but of course, you know, Sam got more conditioned too. So same result, but what's cool about having someone like Sam, like someone who's better than you, it pushes you to make yourself better. So it kind of like leading up to the mayhem, having Eric on board, we went back to my roots and we did that grind. We did like uh, a BK conditioning pipe prep, right? We're like, okay, let's get in there and grind hardcore. And then it was after the first show, it was kind of like, okay, you know, Sam's bringing that competitiveness back in me, which I haven't had that in many, many years. So it was kind of cool to have that. So he pushed me to get better. And I did, I looked better in the second show and I thought I peaked okay. And then what's interesting after that show, I think it was about four weeks later. So I had a diet break after um the max of the second show it was like a three or four day headed into a guest posing i did up in washington about three or four weeks later and again the lead up is so important like that context so it was backing off the gas a little bit and i knew heading into that guest posing i still wanted to peak well even though it's a guest posing i wanted to look good so i did a one day load but i went like half the amount of carbs i did uh with the max hype just because i wasn't as depleted and I actually peaked, I think, looking back in hindsight, my best at a gas posing, like in early September. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that my stress levels were way lower, like peaking for a competitive show versus peaking for a guest posing. Like guest posing, there's no pressure of me trying to compete against a Sam or any of those type of guys. Like, hey, I'm just going to go in there, pose, have fun. And I think the, the like your stress levels during peak week, you keep those pretty tame. You think it just brings an overall look. It was kind of similar situation back in 2014 when I did the Pro International there. I've never been so chill in a peak week my whole entire career. Like the night before that show, I just remember I was hanging out with my brother. We're watching NFL Network, and we weren't even talking about bodybuilding at all. It was just like hanging out, just watching football stuff and, I, oh, yeah, there's, I was there's i was there and i can i can i can attest to 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 the level of conditioning bro because he kicked i kicked that rider's ass including mine so that that was a show that uh, sam was uh, like off and i think that lit a fire under him and i've never seen him look like that ever again so that's how like on a pro level like you can peak even if you're off just a little bit, like someone who is doesn't supposed to be better than you can be better than you just just because of that. So, yeah, Sam, like, mopped my shit up this year. So you got me back. But, yeah, so it's just basically, like I said, the main thing is just lead up. I think the lead up to, like, your shows have, plays a big role as far as how you're going to set that peak up. And for me personally, the approach with, like, myself, my athletes, I like to keep variables – fairly the same like you know i like to see how people are kind of doing leading up to the show how they're looking around refeeds and things like that and try to duplicate their best look the week of the show and try to keep them as calm as possible so hey man watch a movie the night before watch nfl network chill out and so yeah that's kind of like um my approach and then for worlds basically it was kind of similar i just basically did a back load into that show awesome man very cool. And I love, uh, yeah, that point on how at uh, the pro level, it's splitting hairs and, you know, one wrong move 
um, you know, by one person and a few right moves by someone else could be the difference uh, in placings because it's, uh, yeah, very close at that level. Sam, over to you, man. Run us through uh, your peak. Uh, was it changing from show to show? Obviously, you had, uh, you know, Chris on your team uh, to help with the peaks. So tell us about that. Um, so, yeah, the first, uh, normal, I mean, from time, I mean, from I've, since 2014, uh, began, I guess I can start from there. I normally would do like a front loading uh, type uh, type of approach. And um, I worked with uh, Brian Allstrom. Uh, I don't think he, co- he coaches anymore. Um, it was just like, hey, like, I mean, we, we know each other. He's, good, he's a good friend. I know, he know I mean, he's got a bunch of athletes. It was at that point after the show that Jeff mentioned, I was, I was, I mean, I got fourth. I think that's like the worst space I ever had at the time. And I was just like, fuck, like, Okay, like, and I saw people like him. I saw the like massive frozen stage. I'm like, yeah, something's got to change. Um, I mean, I mean, it wasn't. I wasn't in shape enough. I mean, it was just. I mean, it was so many things that I needed to like uh, evaluate. And it was like, hey, uh, I, I, I think I know what to do. Like with you, I'm like at that point, it's, I had nothing to lose. I'm like, ah, fuck it, let's go. So the approach then was just a rapid backloading, and me. Uh, I mean, for members are listening you don't understand right back load essentially i think brett did right back loading for worlds if i'm correct okay um pretty much you deplete hard uh and you ramp up maybe the uh, 24 hours before the show load a fuck ton of carbs um so i did that and that was like the best look at the Orton cup 2014 and that was like i'm like okay we are onto something here so since then i've always done uh, a rapid back loading but this year um did uh rapid back loading and uh, have Chris Barrett on, on the team. So we have the same similar structure instead of loading on Friday on Friday before the show, it likes to load a little bit early on Thursday. Uh, and I was okay with that idea, but I think uh, for the first show, uh, I was not lean enough to begin with. And just to, you know, we all know, I mean, peaking doesn't do shit if you if you if you lean enough i don't care how you peak you i mean you still have fat to lose and um so it wasn't as conservative as, as i would have, i would have liked uh to do but you know it kind of took my notes moved forward uh picked a lot better than uh for junior nationals same strategy but you know just a little bit more carbs uh just because i was leaner um but for, i mean for, Throughout the time, throughout the prep, I mean, the strategies were was the same. I mean, the same. It was rapid. I mean, it was from, I mean, backloading. Um, I think my the last time I did rapid was just a mayhem, and I think I was like the day before, probably like a thousand grams of carbs, just because I was so flat. And um, that's a lot of people were like what? That is a lot of like uh, actually. I mean, when you that depleted, it's just I mean, just you just it just keeps soaking it. I mean, your body just soaks everything up. Is it depending on how big you are? And as I mentioned, I walk around the stage two or five to it's like two or nine. It depends on um, uh, on the day. Um, but for worlds, worlds is a, is a little bit different case, just because again, I had I mean. Kendall, the uh, current world champion, is going to be in the heavyweight class. Um, he's a mass monster. I mean, talk about just fine physique. So for me to be uh, even remotely competitive, I will have to be. It's not. I cannot. I cannot out muscle him. I have to. It, there, was, there was a strategy that went in, and the strategy was, uh, you know, let's do the let's 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 come in uh, in best condition as possible, and. Uh, Funny we mentioned, I think a friend of yours, a friend of most of you, um, I mean, of us guys on here, um, uh, Brian um, uh, Miner, um, I th- last, was it last year or 2017 when he, uh, when he competed? Um, in my opinion, I haven't told him, like, you are, the, that, that is the condition that I'm shooting for. Uh, if you guys don't know who he is, look up on his Instagram. Look up, look up on his Instagram. I mean, I saw him compete at IP World 2017, and the picture does not do, the picture does not do him justice at all. And, like, if I can attain that level of condition alone this year, I mean, I'm a thousand percent content with it. However, the, you know, however, however the, uh, the year uh, went, 
I was not able to do that because it got tougher towards the end. And so for Worlds, I, I mean, back, I was literally, again, you want to have a guy like be, I'll be straight up honest with you. Like, I think it can be better. I think right now you go like 85 or whatever percent, like you can dig a little deeper. So we dug a little deeper and I cracked, I mean, 198 was my lowest uh, right before peaking. And uh, that's a number that I haven't seen in, got i mean a, a while so and which made it even i mean that means and the carbon up process on thursday and friday was actually a lot higher than you know normal and total of between thursday i mean probably around 60 1700 grams of carbs before the show day um which i think was just right at the cusp of just like not spilling where you want to be and uh yeah i mean got us a second place not at the uh heavyweight and uh but yeah i mean it's it in general, rapid backloading, but it's just a lot of fluctuation. Just, I mean, as most of you guys should know, depending on the day, depending on the week, depending on how you look. I mean, there's so much, so many variables that goes into uh, uh, picking strategies. Awesome, man. And Bathtub, run us through uh, the picking strategy. You had Cliff Wilson on board for Worlds. Um, yeah. you know, what did you do in your first few shows? And then obviously Cliff came in. How did that differ to your approach? And run us through that. So from 2009 to 2011, Alberto Nunez actually handled my loading. So we always ran with the front load. And then when I started uh, coaching myself in 2017, I started researching um, all the different loading strategies. And I, I backloaded in 2017 for my pro card win and 2017 Worlds. But in comparison to Clips this year, it was uh, very, very, very conservative. So for the 2019 season, the three shows that I are the two shows that I did before Worlds, I didn't really peak or deplete for them. I treated them as a you know the six days leading up to it as a regular dieting days, and then on the Thursday or Friday, I would just you know toss in two refeeds. Uh, in regards to it's funny Jeff was talking about reducing stress the day of. That's one thing that I've never done. Uh, during the max hype, I was, you know, playing football with my stepson at 11 p.m. I think it was, and I had to be on stage. I think it was seven or eight a.m. in the morning. That's just how I've always been. Uh, so for worlds and working with the cliff, uh, we uh, we did a seven day or six day depletion. Which do you want exact numbers or? Sure. All right, so I had previously been dieting on 140 grams of carbs with one weekly refeed at uh, 360. Uh, peak week started off at 100 grams of carbs, and they were slowly tapered down, uh, reaching anywhere from, I, I believe the last day Thursday was 80 grams of carbs. And then Friday, we rapid back loaded on 650, in which I was sending pictures every hour, hour and a half to Cliff. And he was responding with either, uh, you know, stay in the course of the plan or we're going to throw in more food. We ended the back load around 9 p.m. I woke up at 3 a.m. And then we continued the procedure of back loading even more because I woke up flat. Uh, leading up to this stage, which I believe pre-judging was around 10 a.m. for the band and weight class. I had consumed around 900 to 1,000 grams of carbs within... Uh, 32 hours and the, the funny thing is is the majority of the carbs actually were uh, uh, via liquid calories so Gatorade or dextrose which was another thing that I had kind of toyed around with in the past but definitely something I you know wouldn't consider utilizing how did your st how'd your stomach go with all the liquid calories and so funny thing is in the off season when I was using, you know, Gatorade and whey as meal replacements, just, to, you know, get in the amount of carbs that I wasn't taking, I, I was having GI issues. So I was a little bit nervous. You know, I had a little bit of anxiety with having, you know, such frequent uh, meals with just straight up Gatorade and whey isolate, but there was no GI issues. So, I mean, thankfully. 
That's very interesting. Very interesting. Well, fellas, I think uh, we're going to have to put a stop on uh, this discussion for now. Uh, we're going to table it. I'll obviously speak to you all off air, and we're going to pencil in uh, round two because I think there's uh, plenty more to discuss, but I'm cognizant of your time. Uh, it's getting late over there where you are, Jeff. Obviously, I saw the, <laughs> the lights are slowly getting uh, dimmer and dimmer and uh, darkness uh, entering the room. Um, but thank you all very much uh, for your time. I'm sure the guys uh, took a lot away from this one. Very much looking forward to chatting with you all further. And thanks for giving us an insight into your 2019 uh, preps.